Chapter 4, Reaching the Audience. Welcome back, everybody. You made it to Chapter 4. I'm proud of you. Let's jump in. A lot of people, when they get into the public speaking realm, they try to focus a lot on their selves. And, and one thing I want to tell you is, is that you need to take the, the focus off of yourself and you need to start putting it on the audience. Instead of asking questions to yourself like, am I going to look good up there? Will the audience like me? Uh, these are questions that you need to get rid of because it's not about you, right? It's not about you. It's about the information that you have to share with your audience. And, and you don't need to ignore the needs and the interest of the audience that you're trying to reach. So take the focus off yourself. It's not about you. It's about the information that you're going to be giving to your audience. It's all about them. And when you do that, when you focus on the audience, this makes you into the best kind of public speaker that there is. Because it becomes obvious that your intentions and your passions are all about getting your information over to the people you're speaking to. Uh, when you start asking yourself questions like, who are my listeners? How can I meet their needs? How can I reach their uh, their needs? How can I reach them with my message? That's what's going to make you into a fantastic public speaker. And we do that in a couple of ways. Uh, if you're an audience-centered speaker, there's two things that you really do. You analyze your audience, and then you adapt your speech to that audience. And when you come to analyzing your audience, you, you try to find out exactly who the people are that you're talking to, uh, where they're from, what they know, and then once you figure all of that out, you begin to adapt your speech to the things that they already know, their knowledge, their prior knowledge, and, and also their needs and their interest. Once you do that, you'll find that you're able to communicate much clearer. Uh, for instance, let's look at this uh, example. Uh, what do listeners know about ice packs using as first aid? We've all sprained something before, whether it's an ankle or we've got a bruise. We've all had times in our life where we needed to use an ice pack. Now, before you put together a speech on, on ice pack usage and how to keep down swelling, you have to ask yourself two questions. First of all, who's my audience? You need to analyze your listeners to find out who they are, what they know, and what they don't know about the subject. Because you need to know if they, they already have the basic information on using ice packs. Because if they do, then you don't need to waste your time by giving a speech on ice packs. I mean, that's just really what it comes down to. Find another topic. But let's say you discover that they lack knowledge about certain aspects of ice pack usage. Well, then the next step is to adapt your speech and provide the precise information that the people don't have access to or did not know. For example, let's, uh, let's think that you, uh, you're giving a speech and you discover that your listeners don't know that ice packs should be used for only 20 minutes every two hours. And so you've got some really cool new information that you can give to your audience without uh, boring them, obviously, if they already know how to use an ice pack. So there are some tips and tricks uh, that you can use to adapt your speech to your audience. Imagine giving this, uh, this speech to a group of EMTs or paramedics or nursing professionals, doctors. They know this, but if there's new research out there, then you adapt so how do you how do you get to analyze your audience? How do you how do you know how much they know? Well, here's a few slides and a few tips on how to uh, get some information about who you're going to be speaking to. The first is this: you can do some interviews. Uh, if you want to get some information about the audience you're going to be talking to, interview the person who asked you to speak. Interview the the program director. They can give you uh, the names, perhaps, of a couple of people who will be in attendance for your presentation, and you can actually call them. You can you can give them an email. You can do whatever you need to do to find out how much they know about the subject you're going to be presenting on. Another very useful thing that I've actually seen work very well is to distribute a survey. The same thing. Find your program director. Get the contact information for several people who are going to be in your presentation and send them a survey. One time I was part of a group who was putting on a conference, and one of our speakers for the conference actually put together a survey and emailed it to me. Uh, asking questions about what I knew about the topic that she 
uh, was going to speak on. And, I, and me being someone who was familiar with the presentation process, the public speaking process, I knew what she was doing. So I filled it out very thoroughly and sent it back to her. So that way she knew what I knew. That way she could adapt her speech to what a lot of the people in the room would probably have already accessed uh, and prior knowledge to. And tell you what, it was one of the best presentations at our particular conference because it didn't dumb anything down. We didn't go back to the basics. She knew we had a grasp on the basics and was able to give us new information or a, a new viewpoint on old information. You can see this survey here. Have you ever used an ice pack for injury? Yes or no. And then what's the maximum time for applying an ice pack? If the speaker gets back all these surveys and everybody know it's supposed to be 20 minutes, well, she can or he can take the time and adapt it into a different way. But surveys are very good to find out prior knowledge. You also need to know that your audience is going to be very diverse. Uh, we live in a wonderful country, and there are people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, uh, different geographic backgrounds. They're from all over the place. And so you're going to have to meet the needs and the interests of a very diverse audience. You need to know about the diversity in the world that we live today. And one of the things is gender is a big deal. Uh, if you didn't already know this, guys and girls are different, uh, and the gender of your listeners uh, may give you to, some clues about uh, their social and economic situation. Uh, for example, think about this. Uh, even though we've made a ton of advances today in, uh, in women in the workplace and how they're treated and how they're paid, um, a lot of females still receive way lower wages than their male counterparts in the workplace. And they could be performing the same job, and they're still being paid less. So let's say you're a speaker, and you're trying to persuade workers to join a labor union. If you were in a situation like this, you could stress the inequities if some of the listeners that you're talking to are actually women. And so that may persuade them or motivate them or inform them to the point to where they will join that labor union that you were talking about. You also need to take into consideration people's age. If you have a variety of ages that are going to be in your audience, you have to be sensitive to the interest, attitudes, and knowledge of all of your listeners. Uh, for instance, you really need to give explanations or backgrounds whenever is necessary. If you're going to give a, a speech and you're talking about, uh, I don't know, Taylor Swift, a musician who's very popular today, uh, and you have an older generation in your audience, you may need to give background, maybe give a couple of examples of the songs that she has produced and just tell a little bit about who she is. That way you catch them up if they're not familiar with that particular artist. Uh, so you have to be careful. If we were going to be talking about YouTube, uh, a lot of people in our older generations may not know what YouTube is. The same thing is if you have an audience of younger students, you have to adapt uh, to their age as well. You never speak down to them. Uh, you, but you always need to make sure that you are keeping them all on the same level of knowledge. So there's some definite uh, differences in age diversity when you have to address a crowd. where And, and a lot of planning needs to go into if you know your audience is going to be diversified by age. Also, you may have an audience that is uh, varied in their educational background. and You need to always consider the educational background of your listeners. You need to avoid talking over their heads or using concepts or language that they can't understand. Uh, this gentleman here, he's obviously a graduate, maybe even of college. But if you're a professional in the medical field or something like that, this, this gentleman may not understand your terminology. He may not understand your jargon that you are using. So you may need to put some parenthetical explanations or definitions into your speech so that your entire audience understands where you're coming from. Now, at the same time, you don't treat your audience like children, okay? Don't talk down to anyone, uh, especially when you're, you know, when you're describing things or giving definitions. You don't want to, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, don't be sarcastic. Just, just be polite and explain things in a great way. It'll keep your audience all together. Now, people have different occupations, and you have to keep that into consideration as well. You have to adapt your speeches where the occupational background of the people you're talking to comes into consideration. Just think about this guy. He's a fireman, obviously, but would you really need to explain to this guy how fires get started? 
you wouldn't. You would need to find some other deep, uh, maybe unknown facts or some cutting edge research on fire science and present that instead of just the basics. This guy knows how stars fires get started. He he wants deeper information. You also need to take into consideration people's religious affiliation. We have a bunch of different religious, and even if you're thinking about the denominations of Christianity, uh, there are different beliefs and different thoughts even in the realm of Christianity. But you need to take into consideration people's religious affiliation. For instance, uh, most Seventh-day Adventists, for example, they're very knowledgeable about nutrition because of the strong emphasis that that particular denomination places on health. So a lot of Seventh-day Adventists are are vegetarians, uh, they're non-drinkers, they're non-smokers. And so if you're going to be asked to speak to a group of Adventists on health-related issues, you can just assume that they're going to be pretty well versed in or, or have a higher level of background knowledge on what it means to be healthy. So you're going to have to skip the basic knowledge and then hit some more in-depth knowledge. Also, you've got different economic and social statuses that are going to be in your audience, and you need to adapt your speech around that. Uh, Let's say you're going to give a speech about uh, food stamps for the poor, and your listeners are majority uh, from a low economic background. A lot of them will probably be favorably disposed to your ideas before you even get started. And so you, therefore, might want to aim your speech at encouraging them to support political candidates who are going to protect the food stamps and protect those programs uh, for people uh, who just need that help up. Now, if your listeners are going to be upper middle class, however, and you still want to talk about food stamps, a lot of those attendees are going to be opposed to your ideas, and you may have to aim your speech a little differently. You may have to aim it at winning them over to your thought processes to show them the benefits of social welfare programs. So, Just know your audience. Know you're going to have to adapt. Now, sometimes in your audience, you're going to have some international listeners, and you need to be very careful about some of your nonverbal gestures. There's a lot of taboos out there. For instance, this gentleman here, he's putting up what we consider to be, hey, I'm okay, the okay sign. But in different countries, this is actually a very insulting uh, gesture to make. So you have to be careful about your nonverbal tattoos. Think about this. If you've ever been to Disney World or Disneyland, Disney World and Disney Company in general teaches them that you should never point with one finger. You should always point with two. So if someone comes up and asks you where the restrooms are, you point with your two fingers, your pointer finger and your middle finger, and you will make the direction. Think about airline attendants when they're giving their speeches about where the doors are. Watch their fingers. They're putting two fingers toward the door because in certain international, different international countries uh, and different nations, the single finger point is considered extremely rude, and you don't want to be a part of that. Uh, so you have to be careful about your gestures. Uh, you know, uh, you don't want to offend anybody who would be in your audience. You also need to learn some nonverbal signals. And you need to know that in different cultures, uh, eye ex- contact and facial expressions, these things vary from country to country. A lot of times uh, American businessmen uh, go into a different country and they assume that a person who won't look them in the eye is being very dishonest or they're lying or they are being elusive or evasive for some reason. But in many parts of Latin America, Asia, and Africa, keeping your eyes lowered is actually a sign of respect. And so you have to know these things, especially if you have a diverse international audience. If there are people in the audience who aren't looking directly at you, it's not that they're not listening. It's not that they're being rude. It's just because of their cultural differences, they are respecting you by not looking you in the eye. Remember, you've been told never to uh, look a, uh, a, you know, a, a dog that's barking and charging straight in the eye or, a, or some wild animal because eye contact in that realm can be considered a form of aggression. Well, the same can hold true in different cultures. They believe that it's very disrespectful or if they stare you down that they are being aggressive to you while you're speaking. So just be aware that there are different uh, cultural nonverbal signals and just be aware of that so that you don't uh, 
fail, fail in the process of receiving that feedback and adjusting your speech on the fly. We've got a bunch of different diverse, diverse cultures here in the United States. You have to avoid ethnocentrism. And let me tell you what ethnocentrism is. It's basically uh, the idea that your own cultural group is going to be superior to other groups. Uh, for instance, here in the United States, we believe that uh, falling in love uh, with the person of your choice makes for the best uh, long-term marriage situation and makes it last, makes it real, makes it very successful. But other cultures, uh, and, and it's a minority, but another other cultures, they believe that arranged marriages by their parents are actually the ones that have a greater chance of success. Now, which one's morally superior to the other? Which one is right and which one is wrong? Well, it's just different. There's no right or wrong here. And you can't really put, well, the American way of marriages, falling in love, dating, being engaged, you can't put those above others in when you're speaking. And so just avoid ethnocentrism altogether. Just know that we have a very diverse uh, culture here in America. Uh, you need to learn the expectations and viewpoints of different cultures and groups. Uh, for instance, Let's say you're, you're a manager and you're going to be giving an informal training talk to a group of employees and you're, gonna, you're, in tr you're trying to encourage them to ask questions as you go along. If they have any questions, raise your hands. And some of the Asian American employees, however, they never ask questions. Now, before you decide in your brain that these people are uninvolved and uninterested, just keep in mind that for some Asian Americans, asking questions is in itself considered disrespectful and a challenge to your authority, and they will never do that because they don't want you to lose face. Even if you're wrong, they won't, they won't question you. So you have to be careful and have to know that uh, people have different expectations and viewpoints when it comes to feedback. What about people who have disabilities who are going to be in your audience? And you're concerned about... Uh, meeting all the needs that someone who is blind, someone who is deaf, someone who may be in a wheelchair, uh, you want to make the experience the best that you can for them. So here's my tip to you. The best resource is actually going to the person. Don't assume someone who is blind um, that you know best for them. Go and ask them. Ask them what they, what they need. Ask the disabled participant. Uh, you're not going to make a social blunder here. The man or the woman who is blind or in a wheelchair, if they're going to need special arrangements, arrangements to get the maximum benefit from your speech, they are going to know what they need. So go and ask them. It's not a social faux pas. Just ask, hey, is there anything that I could do to make your, uh, your experience here in my presentation more comfortable or uh, meet any need that you may have? Let them tell you. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with that. So they're the best resource. They know what they need. If you have someone who has a mobility impairment, let's say they are in a wheelchair and, um, you know, you want to try to remove anything that is a barrier to them that's going to limit their access. Whenever there's a choice, make sure you ask the listener where they would like to sit. Don't just assume that they want to be in the back of the room. Okay, don't do that. Uh, they may want to be in front. They want, may want to be in the middle. If we have access to get them there, let's get them there. Never patronize people in wheelchairs, okay? <laughs> that is their personal space. So I, I, don't pat them on the head, all right? Don't pat them on the shoulder. Uh, another thing you don't do is don't lean against or don't hang on their wheelchair. Don't grab the handle and kind of cock your leg over and lean in. All right, that, that's their personal space, and, and you don't want anyone in your personal space, so, so don't do it to someone who may be disabled and in a wheelchair either. Then let's say you do have someone who's deaf or they're hearing impaired. Uh, if they need to see your mouth to understand your words, in other words, they're going to do some lip reading, try to avoid at all costs turning away from the audience. Uh, now, at the same time, you don't need to, Put them in a spotlight by standing directly in front of them either. So feel free to move, but just make sure that they have access to your lips uh, as most as uh, most most of the time as it's possible. Uh, it's also not necessary to exaggerate your words. However, it could be very appropriate for you to slow your rate of speech just a little bit 
so that they can uh, they can understand you. But don't exaggerate. Don't stand right in front of them, uh, and you'll be okay. So people who are blind or maybe they're visually impaired, a lot of times they'll have with them a service dog, uh, a guide dog. And here's what I can tell you. When a dog is working, you leave it alone. If it's a service pet, you don't go up and pet it. You don't speak, you know, our little pet voice to them. Uh, you just let them work because that's what they're trained to do. You don't want to interfere with their duties. And, and they're highly trained work dogs. Uh, they're not going to disrupt your speech, and they don't need to be soothed. They don't need to be distracted by you. So also, one thing you want to make sure is that don't assume that people who are blind or have a visual disability are uh, people who are, are not going to want your handouts. You've got a handout. Don't just assume that person because they're blind doesn't want them. Because even if they can't see, that's some good information on there. And they have either A, someone who can reread that to them later on if they want to refer back to it. Or there's all kind of cool technology that they have access to where they can actually put it under like a camera and a computer will read it back to them. So don't, uh, don't leave them out on the handouts. You definitely don't want to do that. So remember, you need to know how much knowledge your listeners have about your topic. So you need to find out the answer in advance so you don't go in and and do something incorrect. So let's think about this. You go into an audience and that audience knows a ton about what you're going to talk about. So if they know a lot about what you're going to talk about, they're going to be extremely bored. They're going to be resentful because you're going to waste their time if you did not prepare talking about information that everyone already knows. Instead, you have to give them new ideas and concepts. Early on in your speech, just reassure them that you're going to be covering some new ground for them. For example, let's talk about you're talking to an audience of, let's say they're advanced snow skiers. And you tell them in your introduction that you're not going to give them a lot of uh, talk about well-known nearby ski resorts. Instead, what you're going to do is give them some tips on some good out-of-the-way ski resorts that a lot of skiers may not know about. So, see, you're giving them that kind of uh, nuancey information, that kind of niche information that they they need because they already know the basics. Give them the cool stuff that not a lot of people know. Now, on the other hand, if you have an audience that doesn't know hardly anything about your topic, they know little about your topic, what approach should you take with them? Well, here's the deal. On those, you have to really be careful and limit the number of new ideas that you're going to be discussing. Uh, people can absorb huge amounts of new information in a short period of time. So if you overwhelm them with too many concepts, they're going to lose the interest in what you're having to say. And guess what? They're going to tune you out. So whenever possible... You need to use visual aids to help them grasp the more complicated concepts. So provide a lot of support materials. Use a lot of examples. Use a lot of stories. Use statistics. Do whatever you can to uh, fully explain what you have to say. Now, here's where we're mostly going to be. What, do you have an, what if you have an audience that is comprised of people who know a lot about your subject and people who don't know anything about your subject? Well, there's something for you, right? What do you do then? It's a lot easier if you know they don't know a lot, or it's much easier if they, you know they do know a lot. But if this audience has some of both, here's what you do. The solution is to start at a very simple level and add complexity as you go along. For example, let's say you're going to talk about uh, identity theft, and you've got an audience of people, they're mixed. Some know a lot, some know a little. You can hold the attention of everyone by saying something like this. I realize that some of you know nothing at all about this problem, while some of you have already become victims. So to bring everybody up to speed, I want to begin by defining what identity theft is, and then I'll get into the nitty-gritty of how we can defeat the crime. Now, see what I did there? I told the people who know a lot about my subject already that, hold on, you've got some really cool stuff coming, but before I get there, I'm going to meet the needs of everybody who may not understand what identity theft is. You're hitting both crowds. And so audiences love this kind of uh, sensitivity um, because what will happen is if you don't give that disclaimer to the people who know a lot, they're going to tune you out, they're going to be done, and they'll miss the information that you really have to give them at the end, their nitty-gritty stuff if you don't let them know it's coming. So be careful and let them know that it's coming. You also need to know 
uh, about the psychology of your audience. Some people are forced to go to meetings, right? You're in a business and boss said you had to go, so you have to go. And some people are excited to be there. They're pumped up. Uh, you need to think about their attitude toward the things you are going to say. Are they excited? Are they indifferent? What's their interest levels? It, are they extremely interested in learning more about what you have to say, or are they really bored just because of the mere mention of your topic? You're going to have all of those, so just be careful. And one thing I want to tell you here as we kind of wrap up with another two slides is this, is that you have to pay attention. You've heard me say this already. You have to pay attention to your time limit. Listeners get really ticked off and irritated, and they get restless if a speaker goes over the allotted time limit. A lot of people, when they're being spoken to in public occasions, uh, they absolutely hate it because it's really marred by someone who's long-winded. You know the speakers who just kind of drone on and on and on? Uh, you want to find out how much time that people have given you to speak, and here is the key. Never go over that time limit. Do your best to stay within that time limit. Don't go over. And the last thing we're going to end up on here is this. Know, know your audience size. Know how many people are probably going to be there. There's nothing worse than walking into a room where you think 20 people are going to be listening to you and to come to find out there are 200. So know your size of your audience before you walk in. You're going to help prepare yourself psychologically, but it's also going to help plan your presentation and your handouts. Uh, you know, you may need some huge visual aids instead of small visual aids. So just know, know who your audience is. And by doing that, by knowing who your audience is, it's absolutely going to help you uh, to reach your audience and get your points across in a very concise and effective way. And that's the end of chapter four. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.